everybody. It looks like we've finished praying. And uh, so let's, let's take our attention to God's Word in 1 Corinthians. Just got to tell you, I, uh, the sounds of God's people together with prayer and fellowship is, uh, is needed medicine for my soul this week. And I hope it is for yours too. This is why we come together on Wednesday nights. Uh, this is what a midweek uh, refresh is all about. And it's the same out back right now. The students and the next gen, they have, there's a whole house full of people out there this week. So we praise God for that. Let me, as you go, I got to mention two things that I was supposed to mention before. One, we're supposed to pray for the food pantry. We need to pray for the food pantry. Uh, continue to help give toward that. The first distribution is a week from tomorrow. And so we are, if you know some people who are hungry, send them our way from 11 to 3 next Thursday. We're going to run that in the paper next week and on the radio so others can hear it. And we're going to put some flyers up. Uh, but we're going to, we're just trial and error. So it's not going to be a perfect process, but we're going to have bags that people can have, uh, or boxes, excuse me, boxes that people can have um, loaded up, ready. And it'll come with a voucher, not only for the dry goods, but they'll get a little sticker that takes them to Piggly Wiggly, get a gallon of milk, a dozen eggs. Uh, on us. So I'm excited about this. If you want to help, um, Bruce and Brenda are looking for some, or, you know, you can get with them and they'll communicate with you on ways to help or just be here on Thursday and help pack some boxes and uh, and just bless some people. That's uh, no strings attached. If you're hungry, you can have till we run out or whatever it is. So pray for that. Also, I just wanted to share another reason to rejoice, our, our small group ministry. and That's some of the stuff we were actually just sitting up here at the front talking about. But Sunday, we had 120 in small groups, which is just knocking on the door of what was a pre-COVID number. And with the exception of one week out of the last six, we've been in triple digits. And that one, we had 99. And so we are there as a significant groundswell. The Lord is bringing people back. We're bringing new people into our fellowship getting back to a consistent level, so we, we rejoice. And this is the plug and reminder for you, come to Sunday school, come to small groups, get connected. We even have a couple of organic groups that are starting to meet at homes during the week. If that's a little bit better option for you, I can share with you where those are. But get connected to a group and see the Lord grow you to that next level of discipleship. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Let's read together for just a few moments where we hear of... The loss of loved ones, the homegoing of saints. How do we respond? How, I shared with you earlier that the Loveless family, although they were sad, they're a close knit family over there. It's a small world. Some of Doyle and Pam's nieces uh, went to church up at East Toboga for a time. One of them, she and her husband are still very involved, so we knew them in you know our past life. And then we move down here, and it's just funny how the Lord brings all these connections around. Um, but they are all very, even to the extended family, very close knit, closely knit. So we were there tonight. Where does that peace come from? Where does the peace come from from the Christians in Ukraine or Afghanistan tonight who are facing difficult days? Those we've talked about. Where, what is it about Christian people who can look at something that, that seems like such finality? And look at it and smile with peace. Even through tears. How does Pam tonight, as she was doing with everybody, she's tears dropping off her face, but she's smiling. And confident in the Lord. How, where does that come from? Are we crazy? Is something wrong with us? Or is it what the Bible teaches? Let's read and find out. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers... Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ, or the dead, will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the consideration of his word tonight. I don't have a very cogent and flowing outline or presentation to give you. All I have for you tonight are the words of our Lord. Death is coming. We're blessed to have a medical professional in the room. Uh, Doc, how many people have you known that got to advanced age or terminal illness and didn't die? None. You've had family members go to be with the Lord, even in the last year or so. Doc, Doc, as we joke all the time, but Doc is the closest thing to a healer that you can get this side of Jesus because he's been trained and knows the proper mixtures of medicines to give you to heal your body of whatever calamity befalls it. But there's some people that Doc just can't save. And he's told stories about being in medical school and in residency and being in other contexts before, and he can share those with you. Uh, heartbreaking stories, difficult stories. Death is reality. We forget it sometimes. People in Doc's situation, maybe they get the best reminder. Others who work as a nurse or those who experience immediate loss. Other than that, a lot of us are insulated from it, right? When we go to the funeral home, it was interesting the first time that we had a death in our church family after Shelby and I were married. Shelby went with me, and I was a oversight on my part. I didn't think anything of it. You know, my, I grew up in a pastor's home. I, when my mom worked third shift at the hospital as a nurse, my dad didn't have anywhere else for me and Seth to go. So we rode with him to funeral visitations, to wakes, to viewings. He'd dress us up, and we'd go in, with, walk through the line with him, or stand there with him, or go sit out in the car while he ministered to families. Shelby had never been in that situation the first time we we had a death. And so we walked in together, and I'm walking up somewhat confidently, having been a part of it, desiring to go to be with the family and minister. And we were holding hands, and she, she recoiled. She'd never seen what was the earthly remains of someone with no life in them before. And she was in her mid-20s and had never been in the presence of that. Now, that's not what our discussion's about tonight. It's just to, to illustrate the point that, that we, are, we are insulated from it in a modern society. We, are, we deal with it as soon as we have to, and we deal with it very uh, carefully, but pointedly, and then we move on from it. But the Bible paints a, a very different picture. And it's a picture the world needs to see. Brother Doyle's life did not end Monday afternoon. Do you know that? Clinically speaking, his heart stopped beating. Doc can tell you the specifics of clinical death, but no brain activity. His heart stopped beating. They were trying to preserve that life, but ultimately, it left. But I can stand here tonight and tell you that he is alive as he has ever been. How? Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, this passage tells us, was dead, buried, and raised to life that we might participate in the same resurrection. Dear ones, what this word teaches us tonight is that we must participate in that if we want to live with him for eternity. It says very plainly when we first read there in verse 50 that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Doyle Loveless could not go to be with the Lord in the state that he was in. Nor can any of us. We must take that same journey that Jesus took. We must have our faith firmly placed in him. But because our brothers faith was there and because of these others that we've seen them go to be with the Lord very lately that we knew and were confident in their faith it's a great peace that comes when we understand that they have inherited the kingdom of God not through the perishable reality that they lived in here but because their faith was in the imperishable son of the living God it's in these moments that death comes into our midst and sort of invades just briefly goes on a raid and kind of runs in and takes one of our own and seemingly runs back out and we experience that sudden loss and and, and Doyle's loss was sudden he he had had his health issues that he had struggled with and and a lot of severe pain that he'd lived with every day but 
There wasn't anything eminently pressing that gave anybody any clue that he was about to go to be with the Lord. Death comes. And we don't know when it's coming. But this passage here tells us what will happen as a result for every person who is in Jesus Christ. And naturally, as we read it, we can infer the opposite for those who are not in Jesus. We can see here what happens both for us whose faith is in Christ and see the great loss that will be for those who are not. I tell you a mystery, Paul says. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Now that, of course, lets us know that there were some who were asleep in the church at Corinth, some who had went to be with the Lord. We also read that great passage in the letters to the Thessalonians where uh, Paul is explaining that, yes, the day of the Lord is coming, but some, some may go to be with the Lord first. and He didn't want them to be ignorant concerning His coming. And so he described the reality of what happens for those who die in the Lord and how we will all be united and brought together in that great meeting day that's coming. He says, I tell you this mystery, we won't all sleep, we'll be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, and if you're underlining or highlighting when we read through it, you need to just highlight or underline that phrase, this body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, And the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the same. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Tomorrow morning, we will go over to the funeral home and we will have a celebration of life gathering for Doyle Loveless. And we will point others, as Brother Jerry so lovingly has said all day long, we're going to point people to the Lord that he loved. And we will tomorrow. It will be a clear testimony of the gospel that Doyle had placed his hope in. Then we'll go, we'll ride out to Barfield. And we'll go up on the side of the hill there in that community and go out into the cemetery where Benefield has sent some people to prepare the spot. And there we will deposit his remains. You've heard the saying, dust to dust. From where he came to whence he returns. But he won't be there. All that we'll be doing tomorrow will be for us. It will be a reminder for us of of our perishability and of the great hope we have in what Jesus has done for us. I like to stand in that moment. If one of the others who we minister with haven't already gone to this passage, go to the passage we read very recently and hear about Lazarus. Now Jesus, as he came into Bethany, was... Confronted by the sisters, by the one sister at first. He said, if you'd just been here, he'd still be alive. And Jesus said, it's going to be okay. And Jesus like, I know it's going to be okay on the last day, on the day of the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me and lives, and even though he dies, he'll still live. And he looked at her and said, do you believe this? such a fitting moment when we stand over open earth and are about to deposit what is, was the remains of someone we love to look at those who gather and say, do you believe this? But it's fitting tonight for us to think about it. Do we believe this? Jesus is not the resurrection and the life for those who don't believe in him. And I know all of you so well, and I'm confident that your faith, and I encourage you to be sure that your faith is there. But then we go a step further. Who around us tomorrow needs to know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? That Jesus takes the sting of death away. Who needs to know that? We just heard. Russell Love's church texted me. And then Trisha mentioned the, the young man at, at Welburn. And I, I know no, nothing else about that context tonight other than to point you to the fact that people die in Clay County every day. That's just right here. We could get overwhelmed thinking about the people who need to know this in Ukraine and Afghanistan and North Korea. But people die in Clay County every day. Will there be a church who so confidently knows that Jesus takes the sting of death away because he's tasted it himself. And he walked back out of the grave that we might do the same. And would we be a church that would proclaim that to everyone we can in Clay County? Would we be that church? May it be. May the hope of the gospel inform all that we do because it... It holds hope for every moment of life. Matt Redman 
sang a song talking about God's grace. He said, it's there in the newborn's cry. It's there in the weeping by the graveside. There in the sorrow and the dancing, your grace, your great grace. The gospel and the grace contained therein is needed. We need to proclaim it to one another. We need to proclaim it to the world. The sting of death is sin. Power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we pray, before we make one final observation, we need to be as clear as we can. And I apologize to you that I can't be any clearer, that I'm not as gifted as I need to be to constrain this truth to you. But all of this is possible through just one person. The man Jesus Christ. There is no other hope. There is no other name. The book of Acts tells us we read the apostles stood there before the council and said there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we can be saved. Brothers and sisters, the name is not Lionville Baptist Church. Doyle Loveless is not where he is tonight because he was a member here. The hope is not in caring for your family so beautifully and so well as Doyle did for many years. Married in 1986. Two precious daughters and a precious wife. That's not what finalized and finished the race for Doyle. That's not where his hope was. Wasn't in his job. Wasn't in his health. His hope was in Jesus. And listen, it must be the same for you. Your hope must be In Jesus, you must echo the apostles' words and say, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it is, Ben, how do we respond? We're we're all still alive tonight, aren't we? Verse 58 gives us our marching orders. Therefore, beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Because Jesus walked back out of the tomb, closed the loop, gave the pathway that that those who would place their faith in him would be saved, we don't just say, okay, Jesus, I, I pluck that off the tree and take it and then just live as I want to. We must be steadfast, immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. The message of someone returning from death merits your devotion and mine with every breath that we have until he comes back or we go to him. Do you agree with that at all? Do you believe that? Are you going to be steadfast, immovable, and abounding in the work of the Lord? Do you know that any work and labor you do in the name of the one who beat death itself will not be in vain? But he, he will remember it. Would you not? Have lo- and, and some of this, you have to be careful. I will pause and tell you that uh, there sometimes is some trepidation when we come to funeral times because there's a lot of kind of misplaced theology around death. There's a lot of, you, you know... Doyle Loveless is not an angel tonight. I think you know that, but sometimes we got, and I can't say it that freely at the funeral tomorrow, so I'll just tell you, and and sweet Pam knows that, so I don't have to worry about that. But, you know, sometimes you'll hear a lot of odd theology at funerals. People say a bunch of weird things, unbiblical or or semi-biblical things. And by the way, semi-biblical is unbiblical. That's actually a decent line, Rick. You could kind of... You know, and I don't say that much, but you might need to write that one down. Truthfully, though, truthfully, though, I can't back all of this up, but my mind can go there to help me imagine knowing that the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What if we could have been there? Just as an observer, what if the Lord in His grace said, You know what? I'm going to pull back the curtain just briefly. Because you knew him, because he was part of your family. I'm going to let you see just the other side. And he already has through his word. But, but what if he just poured grace on top of grace? And as people were rushing around and helicopters were, or the helicopter was getting ready to take him and family were rushing out to Birmingham, I don't know the moment of his expiration exactly. It's sort of foggy. And, and even clinically speaking, it's hard to say that mind-body duality. We, we don't know. The Lord hasn't illuminated us to when we actually make that transit. But we know we will, and we know Doyle did. 
how gracious, what, how amazing would it have been to have the Lord just let us peer into that moment just for a second. When Doyle Loveless saw the Lord that he loved and served for so many years face to face. And every moment of pain that he's, and if you knew Doyle, he, 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 had, he had a lot of pain. He had had an accident a number of years ago and he suffered every single day. To, to see him realize he wasn't hurting anymore. To, to, to see him lock eyes with the one. And to see the one meet him and assure him, welcome him into his presence and say, your labor was not in vain. Now, I know all about eschatology and all of the different ideas about end times events and how God's going to wrap up time, space, and eternity I'm not talking about that right now. I know there's a judgment for the living and the dead. I know that one day we're going to have to give an account, even Christians, for what we did in the body. But you know the grace of Jesus is that even as he sits on that judgment seat, it's not a doubt that he welcomes in those he loves. And that first moment was not a moment of uncertainty. It wasn't a moment of hope or, or did I do enough? Did I make it? Jesus already did it. And his labor was not in vain. And the hope that he had in Jesus was not in vain. Wouldn't you have just loved being able to see that moment? That reality awaits every one of us. Oh, that it would come even tonight. But until it does, until it does, be steadfast, immovable, knowing that one day you'll finish the race. You'll Cross into that presence of the one that loved you and gave himself for you. Labor with that in mind. And know that death has no power over those whose faith is in the one who left death in his grave 2,000 years ago. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to see you. Even in these moments of grief and loss, Lord, our hearts are ripped open. We... we Feel for those we love and we miss those that are now not among us. But Lord, your word assures us that there is no sting in death anymore. There is no victory that the grave possesses. But the victory is in your great name. The victory is in your finished work. The victory is for those whose faith is in you. So Lord, remind us and may we be ever more steadfast, immovable, and abounding in the great work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In light of all of the wonderful, eternal things you have afforded us. Lord, we do pray for Pam and Emily and Rachel. Pray that we would be able to minister to them in coming days and to be tangible representations of your grace in their lives, may it be. But Lord, as Paul said... May we encourage one another with these words and point each other's gaze to the day that is soon coming. And may we long for it and labor toward it. And Lord Jesus, may it be soon. In your great and mighty and beautiful name, we pray these things.